You're watching IBC TV News. With me now is a man who spends a huge amount of time sifting through every single paper that is submitted for the IBC conferences. Quite a task, I can assure you. It's Nick Lodge. Hello. Nick, great to see you. How Hello. many papers are we talking about? We're talking about an offer of 300 papers, which is huge. Uh, and the committee that I run has to decide how many of those will actually make it to the conference mm. here. Probably about 50. So a hugely, hugely competitive process, and yeah. we're looking at only one in six papers making it to the conference. As a man who's, whose background is, is in research and development, yeah. this, this must be fantastic for you because it means you're actually seeing everything yeah. that's, that's coming through in its conceptual stage, for yeah. example. So what are the kind of the big movers that we're looking at right yeah, now? Yeah, it's fascinating and a great opportunity to look at all the technologies which are coming from the labs worldwide. Some of the big stuff, the really, the really top, most innovative stuff at the moment, I think, is, is in the areas of, of holographic TV, for example, where the Japanese are working on a new development um, which is true 3D, not just the stereoscopic TV that most people call 3D, mm. but it's glasses free, it's look around and everything. At the moment, the technology only allows a four centimeter screen and it's noisy. <laughs> people get incredibly excited about it. So that's the cutting edge in holographic TV, but yeah. maybe in a couple of decades time, you know, holographic TV will be as big here as stereoscopic TV is now. Wow. Compression rates is something else yeah. that uh, I gather has come up this time. Yeah, big moves in, in international national committees in MPEG, in ISO, uh, to look at where compression is going. Many academics thought we'd just about sucked as much as we could out of video compression. There was nowhere to go. We'd, we'd compressed it as much as we can. Uh, but recent uh, studies have shown that we are likely to be able to get a factor of two more compression over the next five years. And the economic implications of that are very considerable. That same quality pictures, but with half the bit rate great stuff. So for example, stereo pictures at the same bit rate that we now would transmit conventional single stream HD. That's so, amazing. That is. That Anything is. else that sort of uh, Virtual human death signing is quite big. Lots of people working in that area. Um, also panoramic um, high definition systems which, which are really useful for immersing you, making you feel like you're part of the environment. Uh, lots of exciting display technology like that. Wow, Nick, thank you very much. Okay. Fascinating to hear thank from you. you. What a job you have. Okay, let's uh, just have a look at what's coming up today here at IBC. Today's conference sessions are all free to attend. First up in the forum, there's a look at the hottest topics at IBC 2010. That's a double session starting at 9.30. In rooms E105 to 7, the issue is 1 gig access at home. Next generation broadband services are already offering speeds of 100 megs. But is that enough? There's a 10 o'clock start, but refreshments are offered if you arrive early. And over in room E102, what's new in digital cinema? This session will cover both technology and business issues, and it starts at 10 o'clock. Now, we live in a connected era. Content can now be accessed through a wide variety of devices, from mobile phones to file sharing websites. But these new forms of media also present a problem for broadcasters, and that's because they need to protect their copyright material, but still make it easy for audiences to access. Rachel Foley reports on the search for solutions. There was a time when the only place to watch an event like this was at the Olympic Village. Now you can see it on your computer or even your mobile phone. Major broadcasters like Disney and Time Warner now create many different versions of any one piece of content to make it possible to view on the many different devices available. So for any piece of content right now, they've got about 35 different versions, these big global media companies. And so the challenge, obviously, is how do you do that without a lot of people, a lot of gear, a lot of kit, and a lot of complexity? And then how do you even manage the versions and permutations? At the moment, protecting all these versions takes lots of separate software. An industry body is developing Ultraviolet, a single program for protecting across different platforms. But if it's to be a success, broadcasters need to work to a common standard. With 60 odd companies in there, uh, there's a lot of people to get in agreement, but we hope that the specifications will be released later this year and they will specify every single part of the ultraviolet ecosystem. There's been much discussion at IBC about how broadcasters can protect their copyrighted content. It's a balance many are finding difficult to strike. I think the key is 
really offering a service to consumers in which, in addition to their normal paid television content that they see in their living room, they now have convenient access to it in other places like their uh, mobile device or their uh, iPad or their laptop on the go. Protecting content presents broadcasters with many difficulties, but it's clear that if they can't simplify the way audiences access that content, it won't be watched. You're watching IBC TV News. Now, on Saturday night in the IBC big screen, there was a special screening of that wonderful Disney Pixar animation, Toy Story 3, in full and glorious 3D. And with me, I'm delighted to say, Vice President of Digital Production at Walt Disney Studios, Howard Luck. Howard, great to see you, and what a wonderful film it is, too. Great to be here. Thank you. Just a line on, on the particular challenges of making 3D animation, or perhaps there aren't that many. Um, 3D animation actually is a little bit easier, although still difficult to produce in 3D. Um, but it doesn't suffer from the things that live action does, where you have to capture it right then and there, and you have to have the cameras actually all aligned and calculated and converged and make decisions on the set. So we, we can twist a lot more knobs on the back end for, <laughs> for animation. Do you want to go out? Then you say, no! No, okay. Oh yeah, totally in. Do you think this has now spelt the end for 2D animation? I don't think so. I think there's a lot of people that still appreciate the 2D, the, the stuff that they've grown up with uh, for nostalgic reasons or for just plain preference, if you will. So I don't think 2D is over in animation. I think 3D is a nice accent and tells a really beautiful story, but you can do the same in 2D. Sure. You, you hinted at the lengthy process of producing any type of animation. Are any tools sort of coming to the surface now to, to help speed up that process and perhaps at the same time bring the costs down? Yeah, I, I think at the moment we're kind of riding on the wave of the IT uh, technology. Uh, with all the CPUs and all the storage, we're trying to leverage all those things as they get better, faster, and actually more energy efficient. So that's a big concern as well for the cost and also to help get, make the process more efficient. Yeah. Uh, what's next for you? For me, I, I'm back to the live action side of the house. So uh, the biggest uh, things on the top of the plate are basically live action 3D capture. So that's going to keep me quite occupied. It's very difficult to do <laughs> or do correctly, I should say. Howard, thanks very much indeed.